Good morning, friends, family, brothers, and sisters. It's both a blessing and a privilege to be standing up here in front of you all for our edification and our spiritual nourishment. If you have your Bibles, I would like you to open to James chapter 4, and we will be reading just verse 8. James chapter 4, verse 8. It goes the following. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Amen. By reading this passage, we are hearing words that are thrown to our direction. Sinners, double-minded. And when we hear these words, we may oftentimes be pushed away to understand the entirety of the, this verse. My goal today is to dive deep into what this verse means and what we can apply into our lives. But before we begin, I want to kind of highlight the idea that one of the greatest results of Christ's sacrificial work on the cross, apart from the gift of salvation where he died and resurrected and defeated sin, is our ability to experience a personal, unique relationship with God the Father. Because Christ died, he became the mediator, the middleman between God and man. And because of that, the veil was torn. We can now have community and connection with God in fellowship directly to him. Now we can experience the intimacy that was intended for the creator and his creation in the very beginning when he created the world. But I'm here to say that although we can acknowledge the truth that we can have a personal relationship with Christ, with God, and with, in unity with the Holy Spirit, we oftentimes fail to strive and seek God in our ways. You see, we come to God when we're in a time of need, when we have problems, when we have so much stuff on our shoulders that we just don't know who to go to. And I'd rather have us go to God rather than search for the answer in the world in our coworkers, in our friends, or on social media. You see, there's no problem with coming to God with our problems. The problem is, is when we use God to get everything that we want. Oftentimes, I'm guilty, you're guilty of asking God for things and never giving anything back to God. We use God for our own gain. We come to him when it's convenient for us. We, when we're comfortable, when we have everything we desire, and then when God wants to discipline us, he wants to submit us, he wants us to teach us to leave our sinful ways, we get a little bit uncomfortable. We decide to, you know, I'm going to take a step back. I'm not really ready to fully commit to you. And this cycle repeats time after time. We have problems, we come to God. When God wants to discipline us, we leave God's presence. We could come up with lots of excuses or reasons why one person would sway away from God so much, left and right and left and right. But one thing that is far too common is people are not committed to the process of a transformed life. We're not committed to change and we're not ready to say goodbye to the world's involvement in our lives. You see, James is a really great passage if you're a new beginner, new believer, or you want to um, get a little bit more serious about your spiritual walk, and he has lots of truths with it. He shares many pieces of wisdoms that can apply to our lives today. In this chapter specifically, we read about the danger of worldliness, the danger of what it is to fall in love with the world. And when we're the most entertained, we're the most distracted and the most manipulated with the so-called happiness of the world, that's the time when it is the best to draw near to God. My goal today is to look at this passage. There's two points I want to share with you. The first point is restoring your relationship with God. And the second point is a desire to change. The first point is our part. The first part of the passage reads, draw near to God. That's our response to God. It's an invitation as well as a challenge to pursue God. No matter how far you've been from God, whether it's for a short time or a long time, you are invited to seek the presence of God. Let me clarify, this is not the first step in the relationship. We as humans, we cannot do good. We cannot seek God on our own because of the evil in our nature, the evil in our lives. God initiated the very first step when he demonstrated his love by sending his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Because he demonstrated this act of love towards us, we can experience of drawing near to him. So in reality, this all 
falls down on our own choice. Do I want to draw near to God or what is holding me back? Well, if you do decide to draw near to God, there has to be some level of commitment. You can't draw near to God but then leave your commitment in the world. If you draw near to God, you have to have disgust of sin. You have to have a desire of purity, of holiness. By taking the step and acknowledging that his presence is a top priority of your lives is what solidifies this commitment. You have to take the necessary steps to make God evident and a priority in your life, not for others to see, but for you to know and experience the joy that it is. But how will God respond to me? How will God treat me? A lot of times in relationships with friendships or family, we oftentimes are hurt. We're abandoned. We don't have trust. We have some sort of guard. But with God, how will he experience? How will he experience that relationship of me coming to him? God's response is really simple. It says, he will draw near to you. God's not preoccupied that he needs a full business day to get back to you. When you're in a time of need, God comes. When you're in a time that you have problems, you don't know what to do, God is there. If you can't see him, if you can't hear him, that doesn't change the fact that he's there. He's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and he is everywhere. Everything he does is done perfectly and properly according to his will because he is perfect. He is perfect because in a sense of we think that God depends on us to exist. But in reality, God exists apart from our existence. We are dependent on God, not that he is dependent on us. Regardless of this status that we're sinful and he is holy, he still responds to us. I don't know why. Maybe the fact is that we are his creation and he loves us and he wants to be a part of our lives. But he cares for you. He wants to know how you feel. He wants to know what you desire the most in your life. He wants to know what hurts you and what makes you happy. He wants to know what fills your mind and just give it to him. A lot of the times we experience relationships that are oftentimes one-sided, where I give my energy, I give my time, I give the resources, I give the finances, and the other person just ignores me, doesn't, doesn't read my messages, doesn't talk to me. God isn't like that. With God, you will never experience a one-sided relationship. And if you do, the one-sidedness will come from your direction, where God will give you blessings. He will give you food, time, money, friends, everything to bless you and equip you. But you will, left, but you will leave him ignoring, ignored. You will leave him and you will not pay attention to him. I recently stumbled across a video on my phone, and it was this skit or an analogy where uh, there's a young man, and he approaches God. He enters the room, and he has this list of demands. He says, God, here's all my prayer requests. Here, here, please answer them. And God takes this list, and he reads over it, and he's like, done. But how are you? And by the time he says, how are you, the man left and shut the door. You see, God wants a relationship with us. He wants to talk with us. And he wants to be with us. But there's a problem. If we want to be in the presence of the Father, we cannot be living in the sin that we're always familiar with. The sin that is ruling in our hearts, we cannot be in the presence of God because of that aspect. Our relationship with sin should be non-existent. Our relationship should be, with sin should be at zero because we are with the Father. So my question is this, how can you have a relationship with God if you have a hard time committing the sins time after time? You see, one has to go. It's either you're enjoying and entertaining the sins or you're fleeing and escaping the sins. If you enjoy the sins, you're not going to have a great time in the presence of God because you're always going to have the guilt, the shame, just like Adam and Eve experienced. They hid from God. But my, I guess challenge is to be like Joseph. When he saw Potiphar's wife, when she was tempting him to do inappropriate things, he was fleeing and running. He did not want to be in the presence of sin. And when we flee sin, we want to escape it. And when we flee sin, we have a deeper understanding of what we truly desire. Which brings me to my last point, is a desire to change, right? When it says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify our hearts. There has to be a desire to change both externally and internally. 
The first point is externally, of cleansing your hands, right? That's more the physical action. That's more of what you do, what you say, how you make people feel. Are you negating someone? Are you putting someone down? In other words, are you glorifying God with what you are? If you're not, put it away because it does not belong in your life. Essentially, you have to throw away everything wrong in your life to start off from a clean slate, So what kind of actions are you doing that you have to have cleansing from? You don't cleanse your hands if you're sitting at home doing nothing. Your hands are clean unless you do some physical labor. But if you're out in the field where you're working in the dirt, you have filth, you have sweat, you have blood, that's what God doesn't want. He wants us to be clean. He wants us to be pure. And he wants us to be more like him. Isaiah, in the first chapter, uh, writes in his book, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16, says this, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Whatever you're doing, God can see. We all know that, we all are aware of that. But for some reason, we don't stop what we're doing. We continue because we have temporary pleasure. But here's a command where we have to leave everything. There could be an external change where you stop all the actions that you do. But oftentimes, we can hide our actions. We can be all of a sudden good. We can uh, treat people better. We can uh, be better. But we can also hide things. We can also not show our true intentions. And in reality, we can fool people. We can come out and sing. We can preach. We can lead Bible studies. We can serve God. But if it's not here and if it's not true, it will be evident. It will be shown. All the actions we do will be evident in the light. And all the actions that we do, first and foremost, stem and are rooted in our heart. That's where the truest and most genuine desires lay. How would people treat us if they could see what we think? If they could see our truest intentions? Many of us would be behind bars. And we would have shame and we have guilt. But people can't read our thoughts. But God can And all of a sudden, we're not fearful of how God sees our heart. It says, God knew David's heart. You know, God has the ability to pierce through anything and see the heart. But yet, God gives us grace and doesn't punish us at the very spot that we stand. What's the difference? Cleansing, purifying. Cleansing is more like maintenance or like upkeep. If you bought a new car and you have kids in the back seat and you have to feed them crackers or something to distract them from the long road trip and they throw the crackers all over, the, all over your brand new car, you will get up, you will pick up the crackers, and you will upkeep and maintenance your car, right? But if you have a teenager that you've gotten them caribou or something like a coffee and they spill, well, you can't pick up coffee. You have to get a purifier, a vacuum, and suction all the coffee out. It's a longer, it's a deeper process. And that's what purifying is. It's a deeper process, a deeper cleansing, while cleansing is just maintenance. Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 4.14 saying, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil that you may be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts lodge within you? You can't let these sinful, bad thoughts rule your day-to-day life. You can be the most caring, you can be the most loving person, but if you're constantly uh, thinking and doing things that are wrong and it's going through your mind 24-7, eventually you're going to lash out when you're vulnerable, when you're weak, and you're going to act the sin that was first rooted in your heart. Jeremiah is saying, leave these thoughts, leave these thoughts from your head. And the last part is double-minded. Double-minded is more like a hypocrite, someone who is really unstable, someone who is not sure with where he stands. He's indecisive. He's unorganized. And that's definitely someone we don't want to be around with, right? Because when hard things come, they leave. And when easy things come, they stay. They can say they trust in God. They can say that they love him. But when problems arise, they are the very first to leave God, and their faith won't be growing, and their commitment will be shown that it was vain. But before we kind of finish off this message, I want for our encouragement to look at the order of this verse. It goes off as, 
Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. It doesn't go like this. It doesn't say, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Then draw to God and he will draw near to you. God doesn't have some kind of requirement for you to be wholly pure and then come to him. God says, come to me as you are. You are heavy, laden, and burden-hearted. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. When people expect you to be perfect, that's understandable because we have high standards. But God accepts you for who you are. What you've done, what you've said, God still loves you. Because when you come to him as humbly, as open as you are, he will mold you more into the image of Christ. And that's the goal of every believer. We will be accepted, we will be loved, and we will be appreciated by God because we are his creation. And the scriptures clarify that. So my application to you is this. How do we take this and apply it to our lives? How do I draw near to God and he can draw near to me? Let's draw near to God in all areas of our life, whether it be emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, financially. We woke up today going to church thinking that, okay, today's Sunday, I'm going to wear my suit, I'm going to wear, uh, I'm going to hold my Bible, and I'm going to go to church. I am in the spiritual part, and God is here. But what about the other four areas? What about Monday through Saturday when I'm at work, when I'm with my friends? Am I inviting God? Am I drawing near to him by my actions? Let this be an encouragement, not just to you guys, but to me and everyone watching this, that our goal is to draw near to God in all areas of our life because in reality, God wants a relationship with you. I would like us to pray about those that are struggling with drawing near to God. I would like us to be reminded to cleanse our hands, keep the upkeep, and push away the sin from our lives and purify our hearts before God. Let's draw near to God, and let's never forget what a privilege it is to be called a child of God. Amen. Let's stand and pray.